In this video, we're going to be looking at the Shannon and Weaver communication model. It's a basic communication model that is not specifically tied to risk communication. I'd like to acknowledge Claude Shannon and Warren Weaver who worked for the Bell Telephone Laboratories and developed this model initially. I'd also like to acknowledge the materials of the communication professor found at this website for the outline for many of the materials. Despite all of our years on the planet, communication still remains as probably our number one problem. You know exactly what you mean when you say something. And I know exactly what you meant when I hear it. But very often what you said and what I heard don't match at all, and therein lies the root of many of our most vexing problems in society. Let's take a look at the Shannon and Weaver model. When you first look at it, it may seem an unusual choice for a communication model. It was originally designed as a technical communication model. Shannon and Weaver worked in the Bell Telephone Laboratories, so they were concerned about how one's voice becomes transmitted uh, to sound waves and how those sound waves hold up as it travels over wires and into a telephone receiver. But over time, this message was applied to many different fields of communication to the point that it's now often called the mother of all communication models. So it has an information source that generates a message. That message is transmitted via some sort of signal. There can be noise sources that interfere with the signal so that the received signal may not be uh, faithful to the sent signal. There is a receiver of the message and a destination. In recent years, the feedback loop has been added to this model. So what we're going to do over the course of this little video is take apart the pieces of this model so that we can understand the difficulty of the act of communication. And then, as we move through the course, we will understand how stress and crisis enhances the difficulty of communication. An interesting twist on this Shannon and Weaver model is how technology has brought the technical aspects of this model very back, very much back to the foreground. Shannon and Weaver identified three problem levels with communication when they developed their original model. There was the technical problem, how a channel causes a problem. There is the semantic problem, the meaning of the message that was sent and the meaning of the message that was received can be very different. And then there is the effectiveness problem. How effectively does the message cause the desired reaction? Here you see an example of a low-tech communication process. Well, let's think about that tin can and string example for just a moment because there are a lot of different components in that simple speech transaction. We always begin with some sort of situation or context from which the need to communicate arises. There's going to be a speaker or a transmitter or a source of a message. There will be channels or media that will be used to convey the message. There will be the message itself. The symbols and semantics employed in developing the message. There will be the ways that we encode the message, the way the receiver decodes the message, and then the feedback loop. In between these two processes of 
speaking and hearing or encoding and decoding we find numerous opportunities for noise interference screens and filters this can include internal noise external noise and cultural noises so something as simple as a speech transaction can really be divided into many critical components and understanding how those different components can cause problems becomes essential to our ability to communicate in general but to use risk communication in particular let's continue with our simple example here of the tin cans and the piece of string and we'll consider what could go wrong but before launching into that I would like you to keep in mind the means of communication that we are using right now where I have created a video and have used some fairly sophisticated uh, technology to try to convey a message to you so today we have many many interesting challenges but let's go back to the string and tin cans and let's start with the notion that a person has an idea. Their idea is affected by what's going on inside of them personally. What kind of day are they having? What kind of life have they had to this point? And all of that is part of the encoding. How you get from an idea to the words. The message is transmitted there could be some external sources of noise that interfere with the message like a slack string and then there is the message that's received that message has to be decoded back into an idea for the receiver and so there are opportunities for the same kinds of internal noise and semantic noise as well so there are a lot of things that can go wrong in the communication process and very often many of them do especially in situations that we encounter in risk communication here we're going to consider some attributes of the speaker sender transmitter part of the communication process this is the source of the message it requires technical skills to varying extents if you are face to face with a person and speaking this mix is going to be simpler than it is for the situation that we're engaged in right now where we are using sophisticated software to create videos and they are being uploaded to a learning management platform that you access through the internet using computers or tablets or other kinds of digital devices so the extent of the technical skills is going to vary from one communication to the next but all of these would presumably require some enthusiasm and active stimulation of the audience so there has to be intent in this messaging that's going to require the speaker to understand the receiver that's going to affect the decisions on how to send the message and how we send the message is going to require knowledge processing preparation and understanding of this whole mix the next part of the communication process we want to consider is the channel or the media and this is how the message is sent you can send messages via email instant message twitter you can use radio you can use live television you can use a YouTube upload there are so many different tools that you have to send your message and your choice of the media or the medium is going to affect how you encode and decode the message obviously you're going to sit down at a keyboard and type in a message if you're going to use print media on the other hand you're not going to be typing much at all if you're going to be using a live broadcast so these are the means by which the message is communicated to your audience or audiences because you might have more than one audience you might have one or more channels to use and some of these channels are going to involve technical support 
if you use digital media if you're going to make your message friendly for all sorts of devices that's going to take more intervention than a simple communication that relies on little more than eye contact now we arrive at the message piece of the communication model and that is whatever information is being communicated there are intended messages that's when you get the information across in the manner in which you had hoped to do so and there are unintended messages that can be transmitted at times sometimes because of technical difficulties with the transmission other times because of nonverbal cues body language and such so the message may or may not be interpreted properly by the receiver so we begin to see as we consider these various components of the risk communication process all the different ways that communication can go awry let's consider symbols and semantics in the context of this slide we're trying to say that the brain is the sender the mouth is the encoder the string is the channel the ear is the receptor the brain is the decoder the person listening is the receiver the slack cord can be a source of noise and the receivers response is the feedback so we've got all of these components even in a communication simple as simple as the string and tin cans but now we want to step back from this and take a look at the slide and consider symbols and semantics when you communicate a message uh, visually what symbols do you use I've chosen these two uh, nondescript characters here I have speech balloons we have tin cans we have animation and those symbols and semantics are also part of the communication process so when you choose colors for um, for a brochure that's all part of symbols and semantics and they may be more important than we often realize symbols and semantics bring us to a consideration of codes and that process of encoding and decoding a message so we have different codes that we use in communication we have the verbal aspect they include the words the actual language the vocabulary that you choose do you choose a technical vocabulary do you choose a familiar simple vocabulary there are vocal codes how you say the words do you use a loud voice do you use an inviting voice how do you inflect the words that you use all of these kinds of things become part of the communication process and then there is the visual code that's everything else things that you see things that you hear smell touch and the like so these all become part of the message process if there is an unpleasant noise and unpleasant smell at the time that your message is being delivered that's going to affect the delivery of your message as we consider coding it's helpful to consider why we believe the things we believe and there are four components to that starting with logos this is the logic that's important the logic of the things that we believe pathos that would be the emotional appeal of the message ethos that's the credibility the power the likability trust of the source their expertise their position in society and then there's the mythos this is the cultural shorthand when we present uh, issues as David versus Goliath or a matter of patriotism the flag and all of those sorts of things so when we choose words when we choose symbols these are some of the proofs that enter into our belief system and that enter into our communication process as well and then is selecting symbols to communicate a message this is determining 
how to transmit the message what words will we use how will we say them what other factors will attend the delivery of these words this is where we have to anticipate the receiver we have to choose the words choose the inflection choose the visual and other stimuli that are going to best support our communication efforts and decoding the message is of course the opposite end of encoding this is where we understand the symbols that have been used to communicate a message when we decode we are trying to understand the intent of the message was the person trying to inform trying to intimidate we need to understand and translate the words the voice the inflection the visual and other codes during the decoding process we need to anticipate the intent of the sender there are many sources of noise that can interfere with the message there are internal screens and that includes whatever is happening inside your mind or body to interfere with your understanding of the message or transmitting the message so these internal noise factors occur inside the transmitter or they could occur inside the receiver so they might include things like things that happened earlier in your day did you have an argument with a family member or are you having a nice day how's the weather uh, it could be events that occurred earlier in your life things that influence the way you believe the, the way you interact with other people these can all change the way we interpret or send signals there can also be physical psychological or cognitive forms of interference that impact how the message is encoded or decoded if you have a disability if you're having a health problem if you're tired if you're hungry if you're in the middle of a hurricane these things all impact how you feel or think and the unrelated thoughts are examples of internal noise that can conflict with the communicated message not all of the noise comes from within us there are external screens as well this would include whatever happens outside of your mind or body to interfere with understanding or transmitting the message so external noise occurs outside the sender or the receiver we talked earlier about how events can affect how you feel but sometimes just the sounds the smell the lighting the temperature time of day uh, the events occurring at the same time as the message and other messages that are conflicting with your message all of these things are external source, sources of noise that can affect the communication process and its effectiveness we can also have cultural screens these would be demographic and psychographic differences that interfere with our ability to understand the message as intended it can be as basic as speaking a different language cultural noise comes from our self-identity the different backgrounds that we come from the beliefs that we have and the culture of the sender and the culture of the receiver are going to affect our ability to communicate effectively because messages can have different meanings in different cultures demographics and psychographics can be factors these are the ways that we understand ourselves these are the ways we understand our audiences we look at their age we look at their gender we look at their psychographics and their culture psychographics would include everything else you can measure or put a number to the difference is demographics are constant psychographic is a self-identified dimension this is what you volunteer yourself as this is when you say you are liberal or you are conservative you are religious or you are not religious and all of those sorts of measures 
across the spectrum of how individuals can vary. Now we're moving toward the end of this communication model. Thinking about the listener, the receiver, or the audience. Every message that we deliver gets filtered through the listener's frame of reference. And that frame of reference is the sum total of the listener's experiences, their goals, their knowledge, their values, attitudes, and beliefs. And no source and receiver have the exact same frame of reference. So a message and the way the message is transmitted has to be adapted to the audience, keeping in mind all the time that noise gets in the way of the communication. We're going to conclude our consideration of the Shannon and Weaver model by including this feedback loop that was not part of the original model. A message is sent by the listener back to the speaker. This would be the receiver of the message to the transmitter of the message, and that is the feedback loop. The receiver becomes the transmitter, the transmitter becomes the receiver. All communication is transactional. It involves a transaction of information, or of feelings, or of ideas. So the feedback operates under the exact same principles and rules as the original transmission and channel does. The feedback may be immediate, or it may be delayed, depending on the nature of the communication. All of those noise screens and filters that interfere with the original message can interfere with the feedback as well. Successful speakers adjust their message based on careful study of the reception of the feedback.